Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation and chronic daily migraine survivor. I'm here today with Dr. Tim Smith. Dr. Smith is a regular here on Heads Up because of his extensive clinical trial knowledge as the CEO of Study Metrics Research. He is also a board member of the National Headache Foundation. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you doing today? I'm having a good day, uh, Lindsay. Thanks for having me on again, and thanks uh, so much for everything you do for our uh, many, many uh, migraine and uh, disabling <laughs> headache disorder patients out there. I know everyone is always happy to hear from uh, from you and see what you've got in store for them, each one of these podcasts. So thanks for doing this. Ah, thanks. Well, thank you for being here. We are uh, really excited to have you. You are so knowledgeable and you always have so much to tell us that we didn't know about before. And today we have a really interesting topic. It is based on data straight from the American Headache Society meeting that happened just a couple of weeks ago in Denver. And it is data that was presented um, from a, a group from Italy. It was presented by Dr. Barbanti, who is a head, Italian headache specialist. And it's about the late response that some people have to anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies. Um, many people may notice a response right away. There's a lot of people I've seen who almost immediately have have a response when, when they take our, our new monoclonal antibody medicines. But um, this study was designed to determine if there's some people who need to take it for an extended period of time before they notice an effect. And so we wanted to discuss this data because it was interesting because it might change the way people prescribe uh, these medicines uh, before they determine that maybe that patient uh, didn't have an effect. So let's let's talk about this. So Dr. Smith, how long does it usually take for someone to notice the effects of a monoclonal antibody on their migraine? Well, so or on their the migraine time, disorder, I should say. There you go. Uh, <laughs> the, um, in, the, in the clinical trials, um, you know, we did these data endpoints, uh, basically looking, looking at month to month response rates and all of the monoclonals uh, had very substantial response rates within four weeks. Um, some of the companies did go back and were able to do some post hoc analyses and show a clear separation within a week uh, after initiating treatment. And we all remember that the, the one treatment by Apti, the IV therapy, has uh, data showing um, a substantial benefit within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but whichever way you slice it, um, the majority of people that uh, respond do so pretty quickly within the first month for sure. Okay. So if often people are noticing an effect within the first month, customarily in the United States, how long are people trying a monoclonal antibody before determining that that medicine just isn't working for them? So the, I think the conventional wisdom and what uh, most of us do in clinics uh, for most of our patients is uh, we usually say that 12 weeks or about three months. So don't give up on to it on it uh, on it until you've taken at least three months of of the inject uh, injectable therapies. I think this this sort of general approach came from the clinical trials where we saw that initial drop in uh, migraine days in the first month. And another increment in the second month, and then a, another one in the third month, and then a sort of a variable response after that. So we think that you know by looking at that twelve week or three month cutoff, we get most of the responders during that time. And I think that's true. But you know the question is, are there some outliers that could take longer? And I think right. that's what Dr. Barbanti and his group were trying to look at. Okay, so this study was carried out in Italy and their goal was to determine, obviously, if some people responded to the, to the MABs as we like to call them, but responded later than what we are used to looking for. So they used a registry of migraine patients to do this. How did they go about this study? Just tell us some, a couple of the things you think we need to know about how the study was carried out if you could. So it's interesting to, you know, and I think it's important for us to, to say, you know, that this was done through a registry, which is um, not the same as a clinical trial, right? Mm -hmm. So registry are, is where patients under the care of clinicians 
who help to uh, basically a registry helps to um, glean and capture additional data. So if a patient um, gets put into a registry with a, a medication, they agree to be interviewed and and uh, have additional data captured more than what they would have just through um, uh, a regular encounter with the with the clinician. And so uh, this Italian group uh, set up this registry where they wanted to take a deeper dive and understand the patient experience in the real world a little bit better. And so they wound up enrolling uh, over 900 patients into this registry. So these are mm -hmm. patients that were receiving care in the clinic and they asked them to participate in this deeper um, uh, data capture uh, exercise. Uh, interestingly, almost 700 of those patients were chronic migraine patients. Um, not surprising since this is being done by headache specialists and headache researchers. They're going to have the, the patients with higher end uh, requirements. And these are also patients who are going on monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and we typically think of, you know, um, patients with higher end care, you know, being driven to those a little more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And um, just over 200 were what they called high frequency episodic migraine. So these are episodic migraine patients that at the higher end, they're not quite chronic, but uh, anyway, I guess long and short of it is over 900 patients and they were pretty, uh, pretty uh, sick, you know, uh, advanced care requiring uh, uh, migraine patients. Um, they're on average, they had failed about five tr previous treatments. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, this was, uh, you know, their data capture was, uh, they did face-to-face -face interviews and they uh, logged all the data into, uh, data capture, electronic data capture, uh, platform. And then they could do analyses from that, have their statisticians crunch the numbers. Okay. Um, so what percentage of these people were considered non-responders at week 12, which would be the point where here in our country, we often consider people to not have, have not responded to the monoclonal antibody therapy. Right, so, so in the study, the definition of responders, their primary endpoint is uh, a 50% response rate, which means 50% reduction in monthly migraine days. So this is right. the standard FDA registration measure that we always do in all of our clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So it was appropriate to include that in this study. But what they wanted to look at was how many additional 50% responders uh, did uh, did they um, uh, have or glean or, or uh, have success with after that initial 12 weeks. So at the first uh, 12 week measure, so patients entering in the study go on to a uh, monoclonal. And then at 12 weeks, they looked at the 50% responder rate and that rate was 61.4%, which means 38.6% had not responded, had not right. achieved that 50% reduction in their monthly migraine days. So close to 40% were sort of left having not responded at that three month point. Yes. Okay, um, so how many of those people, those 40% were thought, who were thought to be non-responders eventually responded in this study since they went ahead and left them on the monoclonal antibody therapy? Yeah, so uh, the, if you look at the numbers uh, out of that almost oh, over 900 patients, there were 352 that were had not achieved the responder rate, the 50% responder rate by mm -hmm. week 12. And after week 12, and they observed them uh, after that, uh, they found that 128 more of them did uh, achieve that 50% uh, uh, reduction rate um, yeah. after week 12. So, <clears throat> so that's, uh, it basically added 14% more to that number. So, you know, if you do the quick math, 61%, uh, responder rate at 12 weeks. And then if you looked at the, the additional uh, 12 weeks, that rate goes up to about 75 and some change, 75%, just over 75%. And, the uh, and, you know, so that is pretty substantial. I know when you, when we think about it uh, for our migraine patients, every one that we can, yeah. you know, get, uh, get to that next level of care. So these are, that's, you know, 128 people, about a third of those of the patients who are non-responders, quote unquote, um, actually uh, just by staying on the treatment, were able to um, get that same response. It just took them took them longer to get to it. 
Right. Um, the number they're throwing out there is it's sort of like a third more of the people um, ended up having a response because they were left on the therapy longer than they might have been otherwise, um, which is pretty much a big deal uh, to any of us out there who uh, are waiting for a life trait changing medication. Um, so how long on average did it take to see an effect in this group that would have originally probably been termed non-responders? Yeah, well, the, 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 the median time to uh, achieving the 50%, the, the additional 50% uh, responders to be added to the number was uh, uh, 20 weeks. So, you know, if you think of, well, the 20 weeks is five months. So if we are saying that um, uh, patients, you know, should try a three month uh, round and then make judgment on that. Um, you know, if, uh, we know from this study that uh, the majority of patients uh, that are gonna be added to the number by continued treatment alone uh, is gonna be peaked at about, 50, at about five months, 20 weeks. Okay. And then there was some interesting data that they picked up. They picked up some information on these people. So what were some of the traits in this particular group that responded a little later than everyone else? What made them a little different? Yeah, I think the, you know, there were three or, or four, there were some key things that I think that uh, sort of characterized these late responders. Um, one was a higher body mass index, we know that a higher body mass index is a risk factor for chronification of migraine. Right. Uh, also, um, higher use of analgesics. So these patients living dose to dose from simple analgesics or combination analgesics, it seems like they took a little longer, may have been mm -hmm. part of that, took a little longer to respond. Um, and then those that had failed more um, previous, you know, had more previous therapeutic failures. So these would have been people who had, if someone has failed, you know, two previous migraine prophylactic agents, you know, compared to someone who had failed five or six or seven, you know, that those people were the ones that were more likely to take longer to uh, see that they would be those late responders as Dr. Barbara. Right. So I find that interesting because we are used, those of us who have a history of failing tons of medicines, we are used to being labeled as non-responders. So it's kind of cool that some of those people actually ended up being late responders, I think. So I found that data to be quite interesting. Um, how long um, <clears throat> do, do you think this data indicates that we should be trying the monoclonal antibodies before giving up and saying, oh, hey, this didn't work for me? I think easily you can make a case based on these data that... Uh, these patients should be given at least a six month trial. You know, okay. if the median um, um, time to uh, realize those additional late responders is about five months, then giving six months or maybe even longer, I think one of the authors even endorsed possibly treating for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think by and large, most, most of us ought to be encouraging patients, especially if they have a higher BMI, if they take lots of analgesics, if they fail lots of therapies, some of those mm -hmm. characteristics that go along with them, it wouldn't be surprising if they weren't completely better, um, you know, in, in 12 weeks and that instead of giving up, we should just push on ahead. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I love this data. I think it's interesting because there's so many people out there who uh, have had a lot of medicines fail them. Notice I said the medicines failed them. They didn't fail the medicines. And um, some people out there have tried some of the MABs and, and stopped at about three months and said, hey, it didn't work for me. And it makes me wonder if they are listening, if this might give them a little bit of hope. Um, and so I, I hope that some people like that are listening and um, that they might think about it and maybe talk to their doctors a little bit. So this data is very interesting to me. Is there anything you'd like to add to this topic before we go today, Dr. Smith? You know, I think maybe I would just uh, follow on to that last point you made about uh, pre patients who have maybe tried three months and, and weren't happy. Um, uh, I think there, it's another common practice out there um, in some neurology or, or general medical clinics uh, in which, uh, you know, the clinicians might give a patient uh, a sample injection, for example, or maybe one or two months 
and then judge, you know, judge them based on that. And that's an even shorter exposure, right. you know, to get a full 12 weeks. And this would certainly, you know, um, I think I would use these data to encourage those folks to really try to uh, push the envelope a little bit, give these folks a real chance to, to get better. Um, and then lastly, this is a topic we talk about from time to time, uh, from time to time, and that is, um, you know, the, this is also looking at the usual FDA measure of reduction in monthly migraine days. And we know that is an important measure. It's important for regulatory purposes. It's important because patients care about it. We also know that there are patients that do have an improvement uh, with monoclonals and other preventive treatments for that matter, uh, in, where the, in which their, their migraine days may not go down but their severity might be lessened, the number of uh, rescue tablets they have to take, for example, or injections or, or nasal sprays might go down, their, their, their migraines might be milder, shorter, and easier to treat, even mm -hmm. though there may be the same number of them. And so we don't want to forget about those people as well. And I hope in the future, we'll have um, more and more data looking at those endpoints as well. Um, and uh, I would wager that some of those folks that got a quote unquote late response might have had a reduction in some of the intensity and some mm -hmm. of their medication use that didn't show up in the monthly migraine days. And maybe the Italian group has some data that they, because they did capture a lot of things from the registry. So maybe they'll right. be able to comment on that going, uh, going forward. So there you go. Right. I think that is a great point that just because um, we didn't hit that uh, favorite endpoint of the FDA, that 50% decrease, doesn't mean it didn't change our lives still. <clears throat> so I think that that's a great point. There's a lot of things that go into improvement, including severity, uh, did it improve your nausea? You know, did it make it so your other medicines worked? So I think that um, there's a lot of things that we need to look at when we see if a medicine is working for us. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Thank you. So thank you for being with us today, Dr. Smith, and answering all our questions. And thank you everyone for joining us. And please join us again next week on the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation.